It looks like it's 11 a.m., so let's go ahead and get started. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Uh, this is the DBA Fundamental uh, Virtual Chapter Meeting for August. Uh, today we have Glenn Berry in giving a presentation entitled HADR 101. Um, my name is Steve Cantrell. I'm the chapter leader of the DBA Fundamentals Virtual Chapter. And let me... The best discounts are gone already. Uh, you can still save $200 plus our $150 discount code up until September the 18th. So if you want to save at least a little money, if you haven't already registered for PASS, uh, use our code. Uh, we're going to have a drawing for a $500 Amazon gift card for people that use our code. One person will win a $500 Amazon gift card. We'll probably be doing that drawing at the end of the month. And um, be sure and don't miss this deadline to save at least a couple hundred dollars. We have uh, Kevin Klein from Single Century today with us. Uh, he's our sponsor, or he's with our sponsor. I'm going to let him talk a little bit about uh, Single Century. Kevin? Thanks so much, Steve. Appreciate that. Uh, hi, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us for this session today in the DBA Fundamentals Virtual Chapter and uh, taking some time out of your busy days to spend it with the group at SQL Pass. If you haven't already taken advantage of your membership in SQL, Pla in SQL Pass, please take some time to do that. Look around at the website, investigate coming to either your local user group meeting or perhaps a, a local chapter meeting. This is where the community for SQL Server gets together these days. And I work at SQL Century. We're passionate about community. Uh, just a quick note about us, we make the deepest and most informative tools of telling you and alerting you about what SQL Server is doing. Our most popular product is right there under the downloads button, something called Plan Explorer. It's a free tool. It's so free that we don't even ask for an email address, so you'll never get spammed. It's a query tuning tool that really helps you see what's happening inside of your SQL statements and helps you figure out how to improve those and make those better. So I hope you'll take a moment, take a look at that uh, free product. Perhaps take a look at our eBooks that are uh, normally $10 in the Kindle bookstore, but you can get for free at the URL there under eBooks. And just get involved in the community. We're a friendly and, and a happy community, and, and we hope to see you there soon. So on behalf of SQL Century, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I'll, I'll have to reiterate, the, the community is just fantastic. Um, I've never been part of a technical community like this that's, that's so helpful. And there's so much free information out there, it's just unbelievable. Kevin uh, talked about uh, that we have lots of other virtual chapters. There's one for practically every language and for practically every topic. Uh, go to sqlpass.org forward slash vc and try to find a chapter or, or groups of chapters that you're interested in so you can get information about those. Here's our chapter meetings coming up. Uh, we have uh, in our down under chapter, uh, we have securing SQL Server. Recommended Practices by John Q. Martin. On September the 12th, we have Understanding Backups by Sean McCown. And back in the U.S., we have Managing Very Large Databases by Bob Pusateri. Um, don't have his name down there. That's on September the 13th. In November, we have uh, Watch Brent Tune Queries. That's going to be a, a lot uh, like um, the one that Gail Shaw did on understanding how she does performance tuning methodology, and Brent is another great one for that. Uh, the Women in Technology uh, virtual chapter on August the 2nd today, uh, improving your PowerPoint skills. Go sign up for that. SQL Saturdays is another form that uh, we have for the community. Uh, here's the upcoming SQL Saturdays in the U.S. And uh, worldwide, uh, I may be going to the Louisville session. The San Antonio session is always a real good one. 
and like Kevin said, stay involved. On to the topic today. Uh, Glenn Berry is with SQL Century. I'm sorry, SQL, SQL Skills. I'll get this right in a second. Um, he's well known in the industry uh, for hardware um, and understanding HADR. The one thing that he's probably most well known for, he's not going to talk about today, and that's his DMV diagnostic queries, which is that's the premium. Um, premium scripts out there for looking at weight stats. Anyway, uh, he's going to talk to us today about HADR, and I told Glenn I'd go real fast, so over to you, Glenn. Let's let's swap right. our screens and let me give you that back. Okay. There you go. All right. Looks like we can see it there. All right, thanks for the introduction there. Uh, this is going to be High Availability Disaster Recovery 101, and I work at SQL Skills as a principal consultant. This is a little bit more about me. I've been there for a number of years now, and I'm pretty active on Twitter. I've got a blog at SQL Skills, and if you're not on Twitter in the SQL Server community, you're missing out on a lot. There's a lot of friendly people on there that you can ask questions to, and you can use the SQL help hashtag to get almost immediate answers for technical questions that will fit in 140 characters. So it's a really good resource. <clears throat> Excuse me, and one other thing I want to point out is I'm a Pluralsight author and I have a number of Pluralsight courses that you might find interesting. And you can get a free Pluralsight pass if you go to the Microsoft Visual Studio Dev Essentials program and join that for free. And <clears throat> Excuse me, and they'll give you a three-month pass to Pluralsight, which is unlimited usage. That's a really good deal you might want to take advantage of. So anyways, what we're going to talk about today are what are the causes of downtime and data loss with SQL Server? And how do you go about planning a high availability strategy? And then what are some of the SQL Server 2016 high availability technologies that you have to work with? And how do you go about planning a disaster recovery strategy and what are some of the SQL Server 2016 disaster recovery methods? And I keep saying SQL Server 2016, but the vast majority of this is applicable to older versions of SQL Server. So if you're not on SQL Server 2016 yet, don't worry too much about that. So <clears throat> what is the definition of high availability? Well, basically, availability just means that something is able to be used as you expect it to, no matter what else is going on. So for example, a database behind a website is available to service transactions and the website is up. And high availability means that whatever that something is, is protected by various different technologies and techniques to make sure that it doesn't become unavailable, or doesn't become unavailable, I should say. And so again, an example is the back-end database is protected with something like database mirroring so that if something happens to that particular database or the server that it's running on, you fail over very quickly to another server and your whatever you're protecting, your website, is still available. And the users and the applications can always do what they need to be able to do, regardless of whatever little disaster happens. But again, what is this something that we're talking about? There's lots of different levels of something that we're trying to protect. So the something is going to vary based on your situation. So for example, maybe you just want to really make sure you protect one particular table. And, and in that case, you could use something like transactional replication to protect an individual table in a database. Or a solution that protects the entire database is also obviously going to cover all the tables in your individual database. Another example is maybe you've got several databases that all sort of are part of a single application. So if you need to fail over, they need to all go together. And so that is protected by an availability group if you've got SQL Server 2012 or newer. And another example is you're trying to protect an entire server that might have multiple instances of SQL Server and many, many databases on it. And a traditional way of protecting that is using failover clustering, for example. And then finally, maybe you're trying to protect an entire data center. So you could use something like SAN replication, which is not part of SQL Server, but that's a pretty common solution for trying to protect an entire data center from uh, going offline. So what are the causes, the most common causes of downtime and data loss? Well, you've got planned downtime and unplanned downtime. And for planned downtime, 
things like doing database maintenance. So something as simple as creating or rebuilding a non-clustered index on a large table can cause you to go down if you're not careful about it. And creating or dropping or rebuilding a clustered index on a large table or non-clustered indexes in many cases will cause you to have unplanned downtime actually, even though we're talking about planned downtime in this instance. And SQL Server Enterprise Edition has online index operations that really help reduce this issue. And it's one of the main reasons a lot of companies will go for Enterprise Edition just to get that single feature that you can use to do for online index operations. And believe me, my, my motto as a DBA is if you ever notice anything that I'm doing, I just messed up. You know, I like to be doing all my magic under the covers and nobody notices what I'm doing. So if you're trying to do index tuning and you find an index that you really think SQL Server can use, and if you don't have Enterprise Edition, then you've got to be much more careful about creating that index so it doesn't lock up the table and cause an outage. And Enterprise Edition really gives you a lot more flexibility for that. Another thing that causes downtime, which may or may not be planned, is doing a big batch operation. You know, we always are told that relational databases are set-based, and you want to get in the habit of doing set-based operations. So if you need to get rid of 20 million rows out of a 100 million row table, the academically correct way to do it is just do a delete statement and get rid of 20 million rows in one shot. But the problem is if you do that on a production database, it's going to lock up the table. <clears throat> and it might only be locked up for a few minutes, but during that period, that table is not going to be available. So there's other ways around that to avoid that, but that's a very common thing that causes issues as far as being up. Another very common reason for planned downtime is doing any kind of an upgrade of SQL Server. So whether it's installing a SQL Server service pack or a cumulative update. And one thing that a lot of people might not be available, uh, aware of is that Microsoft recently changed their official guidance about how they do maintenance and how you should do maintenance of SQL Server. And so I've got a link to a blog post that's on the Microsoft Release Services blog called announcing updates to the SQL Server incremental servicing model. And what this basically is talking about is that they're recommending now that you proactively apply cumulative updates and try to stay up to date because they found with their experience and support over the years that many, many issues are because people have not been maintaining their SQL Server instances properly. And, and there used to be some really scary languages in the cumulative updates that said, well, you shouldn't apply this unless you're seeing this exact problem and you should wait for the next service pack. So because of that, a lot of organizations weren't very good about staying up to date with cumulative updates. And it turns out if you do try to stay up to date with cumulative updates, you're going to run into less problems. And I think you're going to be much happier if you do that, but it takes some work to go about that properly. And so anyways, whether you're putting SQL Server service packs or CUs on, or whether you're doing Windows or Microsoft updates, or just updating the drivers or firmware on your server, that's all things that can cause downtime that you should plan for. And if you've got any kind of a decent HA technology in place, you can use what are called rolling upgrades to minimize your downtime. So rather than, for example, installing a SQL Server service pack on a standalone instance, well, when you do that, that's going to stop the SQL Server service, and then it's going to take maybe five to ten minutes to install, and then it may or may not require a reboot of the entire server, which is going to cause you to be down for much, much longer. And that's a situation with a standalone server, where if you had something like an always-on availability group in place, you could patch one of your secondary replicas, and then when you're done with that, you could fail over to it and patch the other side. And that way you're only down for a few seconds instead of many minutes. So that's the kind of thing you can do with HA technologies to reduce your planned downtime. Now, reasons for unplanned downtime. One thing you can obviously run into, and this is going to vary based on where you live in the world, is a data center failure. So certain areas are prone to earthquakes or flooding or tornadoes. And so that could be an issue where you live. You might have a fire in the data center. The data center could lose power. What's also more common, really, is losing network connectivity. Somebody has a backhoe, and they cut through the Internet 
cables that are coming into the data center. And so things like that might happen and you need to think about, do I really think that's likely? And if so, do we have the budget to have a second data center? And so that's going to vary based on your situation and where you live in the world. Another thing that's probably more common is an entire server fails. And this doesn't happen nearly as often as it used to because PC-based server hardware is much more reliable than it used to be. And Windows is a lot more reliable than it used to be, Windows Server. But still, you can have something as simple as a failed power supply or a failed CPU or the operating system might crash. It doesn't happen very often, but it could happen. Another thing that's a lot more common is an I.O. subsystem failure. So you could lose an individual drive or an entire RAID controller, or there's a bug in your I.O. subsystem, or there's a bug in your BIOS or the firmware for your RAID controller that causes some corruption in one of your databases. That kind of thing happens a lot more often than the entire server failing. And then probably the most common reason for unplanned downtime is just human error. You know, it's so easy. And this is one of the reasons that when I teach people in my classes at DU, I talk about it's a lot easier to get a job as a DBA, as a developer, than a DBA. Because usually when you make a mistake as a developer, you're the only one that sees it at first. Your code doesn't compile or something's wrong with it. And you can fix it before you check it in. But when you're a production DBA, you make one mistake, like dropping a table or deleting a bunch of data that you didn't mean to, or you thought you were connected to your development environment and you were actually connected to production, it's very hard or harder to recover from that depending on what kind of other things you have in place to protect you from that. So again, dropping a table, deleting or updating data without having a where clause is a very common mistake, setting a database offline or accidentally shutting down SQL Server, for example, these are all common reasons that you go down without, you know, having it being a planned downtime. So how do you go about planning a high availability strategy? Well, the first thing is a lot of people jump to the conclusion that they should just pick something like failover clustering or, clustering or always on availability groups and then build their strategy around that. And that's pretty much backwards. What you want to do is find out through talking to your business what your HADR requirements are. And there's two main requirements that are always talked about here. The first one is called Recovery Point Objective, or RPO. And that just means the maximum allowable data loss that you can have when some sort of failure occurs. And of course, if you go to the business as the DBA and say, well, how much data can we afford to lose? Well, they're going to come back and say, none. We can't afford to lose any data. And so what you need to do is say, well, OK, are you sure? Because I can put together a plan and a budget for how we can try to get down to a zero RPO, but it's going to be expensive. So let's get together in a week or two and talk about this. So quite often, if you go through and do that and then show them how much it would cost to try to meet that, they will quite often back off and say, OK, wait a minute. We, we can't afford that much, so maybe we can make it five minutes or 10 minutes. So you need to go through this negotiation. You can't just say, or you shouldn't do as a DBA, just say, well, I'm going to make it 30 minutes because that's what I think it should be. Because the business is always going to assume that it's zero unless you have this negotiation and have them sign off on it. So that's RPO. And then the next one is recovery time objective, or RTO. And that is, what's the maximum allowable downtime when different kinds of failures occur? So if you lost your entire data center because it was hit by a meteor, how long would it take you to recover from that? So you've got to think about, okay, what do I have to do if that happened to us? Do we have another data center we can use? Do we have any hardware? If we don't, how long is it going to take to get the hardware and get it all racked and cabled and everything installed? Do we have backups off-site? So for various scenarios, you have to go through and figure out what you think you can do and then see if that's acceptable to the business and see if you have the budget and the infrastructure to meet what they think is their RTO objective and you need to come to a final agreement on this. And once you know your RPO and RTO SLAs, then you go about trying to come up with a strategy to meet them with the budget and the infrastructure that you have available. And the other thing that's really important when you're thinking about this is what is the context for these SLA requirements? 
So you might hear people talking about four nines availability or five nines availability. And is that 24 by 7 by 365 or do you have an allowable maintenance window every month or every quarter, for example? And so if you take outages during your maintenance window, does that count against your SLA requirements for uptime? And then this is a little chart right here shows you when you start off with 90% availability, that means you can be down for 36 and a half days per year. And that's even Microsoft Access could do that, right? But as you get to 99% and then 99.99, .99, that's three nines, it gets tighter and tighter. And once you get to five nines, that's only about five and a half minutes of downtime per year. And that's pretty hard to do. I mean, just a few failovers, even with something like always on availability groups, is going to eat into that over the course of a year. So it's pretty hard to meet five nines. But this chart's pretty handy so you understand how much down, downtime you're allowed. And of course, again, the previous slide says you need to make sure do you have maintenance windows that you can use that don't count against this, or is it just 24 by 7 by 365? Everything counts. Now, SQL Server 2016 has a number of HA-related technologies that you can use. Now, the first thing that I'm going to talk about here is backup and restore methods. And then we'll get into component redundancy and Windows failover clustering and always on availability groups. And now we've got something called basic availability groups in SQL Server 2016, which is a nice addition. We've got database mirroring, transactional replication, peer-to-peer -peer replication, and log shipping. So we'll talk about each one of these. Now, the first one is just backup and restore methods. And this is really important because no matter what else you're doing, and even if you are doing a lot of things like for HADR, you still need to make sure you're taking backups and testing them no matter what else. And I can't tell you how many times in my career where vendors have come to me or managers have come to me and said, hey, Glenn, we're using database mirroring, so you don't need to do backups anymore because we've got a mirror. No, don't let anybody push you around and talk you into not doing backups as you need to to meet your RPO and RTO SLAs. Because if everything else fails, as long as you have good backups that you know you can restore, you can pull your data back. It may take you some time, but you've got that. That's your final defense from updating your resume or possibly having your company go out of business if you lose all the data and it's just gone and can't be recovered. So it's really important that you think about and make an explicit decision, what recovery model am I going to use for each database? So you have full, bulk logged, and simple. And the vast majority of production databases are going to use the full recovery model. And you may be forced to use the full recovery model because you're using certain HA technologies like database mirroring or log shipping or always on availability groups, for example. The next thing you need to think about is what is your backup strategy? How often do you take full backups and when do you take them? When do you take differential backups and then how often do you take log backups? And how often you take log backups is going to be driven pretty tightly by what your RPO goal is. So, for example, if you're trying to meet a 15-minute RPO, you should be taking log backups at least every 15 minutes. Now, differential backups are actually really useful, but a lot of people don't even think about using them. Because if you are taking periodic differential backups in between your full backups, that lets you skip a bunch of log backup restores when you're trying to restore your database from a backup chain. So think about possibly using differential backups. Another thing you should be thinking about is making sure that you use backup compression if it makes sense for you, which it does for most people. One exception where backup compression doesn't work very well in older versions of SQL Server is for using transparent database encryption. But they actually changed in SQL Server 2016 so that backup compression and transparent database encryption play well together so you get good compression if you're using TDE with SQL Server 2016. The other thing you want to make sure you're doing is backup checksums. And you can set that at the instance level, the default for that, and you can also set a trace flag for it, but you should explicitly use the checksum 
option in your backup command so that you're taking a checksum as the backup is running. And then you've got mirrored backups, which is an enterprise-only feature that actually I'm not really a big fan of, to be honest. I think it's better to get your backup done and then copy it somewhere else rather than running a mirrored backup because with a mirrored backup, if you're running to two different locations, the slower location will slow down the other one and makes your backup take longer. So anyways, the next one that people don't think about enough is what is the recovery strategy? You've got all these backups, but do you know how are we going to recover them? And it's really important to actually test restoring them and have a plan and have some scripts put together so that if your database goes down and your website is down and everybody's losing their mind and hovering over you in your cubicle about how long is it going to take to come back up, you don't want to be figuring out how to do it and Googling it while you're you know, in a crisis. So you've tested it and you know how you're going to do it and you know where the backups live and you know how to get them down to where you need to restore them. And people quite often don't do this. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times at SQL Skills, Paul Randall, he used to work for Microsoft, and he helped write DBCC Check DB. So he's known as a corruption expert. And so we get these plaintive emails almost once a week from some poor DBA who has a corrupt database. And then they find that their backups don't restore. And then they ask us, can you help us, please? And sometimes Paul can help, and sometimes he can't help. And we've seen companies go out of business because of that. So I can't emphasize this enough that you need to actually restore your backups and make sure they work. Now, something that's really important when you're going through a recovery strategy is to make sure that instant file initialization is enabled and that backup compression is being used or was used because that's going to really reduce your restore times in many cases. And then keeping your VLF counts, your virtual log file counts under control is going to reduce the recovery time portion of a database restore and that can make a huge difference. I've seen, if you've ever watched a backup being restored and you've watched the progress where it says 1%, 2% and it gets to 99%, 100% and you're thinking, okay, it's done and it keeps grinding away for another 10 or 15 minutes. Well, that's because it's going through the recovery, and the recovery is taking longer because you have high VLF counts in most cases. So keeping the VLF counts really helps reduce that. Now, another thing that I've got a number of customers doing, it's a good idea, is you can use a secondary restore server. And this doesn't have to be a big, fancy production server but you have a server that's available and you use it to regularly restore your backups. Perhaps every time, every night after the backup is taken, you restore it on the secondary server. And that way, you know that your backups actually work and you can automate this. It's not like you just sit there at two o'clock in the morning and do it yourself manually, but you're constantly testing the restore sequence and making sure that it works and then what some people do in this situation, they'll run DBCC check DB on the restored copy of their database. And if it runs into problems there, then they can run it on production. But this can move the DBCC check DB workload off of their production server to this secondary server that's very useful in some scenarios. So this is something that's pretty easy to do. It doesn't have to be a big expensive server. You can use an older server or you can go out and buy a a beefy desktop and throw 64 gigs of RAM in it and have some consumer SSDs and it'll work really well for this for a lot of people. Now another thing that's really important as part of your HADR strategy is just component redundancy on your database server. It's really important to have redundant components on the database server where it might not be so important on a web server in a web farm for example because if you don't go down because you didn't lose a power supply or you don't go down because you didn't lose a hard drive, then you won't ever have to use your HADR technology to protect from the server going down. And you want to go through and do what you can to eliminate all the single points of failure in your hardware infrastructure. So most new servers have come with either two or four power supplies if you get them that way. But sometimes you'll get pushback from your uh, financial people saying, well, why do you spend on that extra money to get multiple power supplies? But 
For a database server, it doesn't cost very much to do that compared to the cost of the server and your SQL Server licenses. So you want to have multiple power supplies plugged into separate circuits in your data center. I've seen this many times where you've got two power supplies and they're both plugged into the same circuit. And if that circuit goes down, the server goes down. That's an easy thing to protect against. Same way with network ports. Multiple network ports plug into separate network switches. Make sure the switches have multiple power supplies that are on separate circuits. Make sure you have appropriate RAID protection for all of your logical drives. And what level of RAID you choose is going to depend on your workload. And certain levels of RAID, such as RAID 10 or RAID 50, are much more robust than RAID 5. Another thing you want to think about is make sure that you have hot swappable components as much as possible. And most rack-mounted servers have hot swappable fans and power supplies and drives. But some servers don't, some of the least expensive ones. And many tower servers don't have hot swappable components, for example. It's also a good idea, and not very expensive, to have some cold spares available in your data center. So maybe you've got all Dell R730 servers. You might have just decide to have one extra power supply sitting there, or one or two extra drives for whatever drive you typically use. So that way, if you lose something, you can take it out and replace it with your cold swap and then worry about RMAing the failed one from the vendor instead of you know, having to do that and hope you don't lose more before the replacement shows up. So that's just cheap insurance. Now, component redundancy versus, versus HADR. Every HADR technology we're going to talk about has some failover duration, typically seconds, up to maybe a minute or two. So for example, a traditional failover cluster instance has to move all the cluster resources from one node to another and then start SQL Server on the new node. And that takes anywhere from 60 to 90 seconds in many cases. Always on availability groups and database mirroring require just a database property change, so it's much more quick to fail over. But still, you're usually talking 5, 10, 15 seconds, depending on your workload. And then log shipping requires a manual failover, although you can put scripts together that can sort of semi-automate that and make it a lot faster. So it's a lot better to avoid unplanned failovers by having component redundancy. And this is going to just improve your overall uptime statistics. So again, you just want to take advantage of every little possibility you can do to make your database server more robust. You know, the extra hardware cost for a second power supply is really pretty small, a couple hundred dollars typically. But again, sometimes you'll get pushback on this. I remember a CIO that I worked for several years ago that every time I would put a server quote in, he would look at it with a fine-tooth comb looking for one thing to take off of it. And it was just like a game. So after I learned that he did this, I used to just put something on there that I didn't even need so he could find it and take it off. And then he won the battle of taking something off my quote. But you know, if somebody wants to take off your extra power supply to save two or $300 on your $15,000 database server, that's kind of silly. So you need to try to fight that battle. Because again, this is a database server, not a web server. Now, Windows failover clustering has been around for a long time and many people, many IT people are very familiar and comfortable with it. And it's just a SQL Server failover cluster that is installed on a Windows Server failover cluster. So you've got to go in and create a Windows Server failover cluster, typically with shared storage, and then you install SQL Server as a cluster on top of that. So you have to do a special kind of installation with SQL Server. And you usually have two or three or more nodes, a node is just uh, an individual server, and you have typically one or more instances of SQL Server installed on this cluster. And it does require shared storage, which is a single point of failure. It's the biggest weakness of failover clustering is that shared storage. Now, shared storage in the past has always meant a SAN, a storage area network. But there's some alternatives now. You can use SMB file shares for your storage, or you'll be able to use Storage Spaces Direct with Windows Server 2016. So you don't necessarily have to use a SAN if you're going to use failover clustering. But to be honest, most people are still going to use SANs for a while. There's just such an institutional inertia about that. 
Now, one nice thing that you might not be aware of is that if you've got SQL Server 2012 or newer, you can host TempDB on each of your individual nodes rather than having on the shared storage. And quite often that's a really good idea because it takes the TempDB workload off of your shared storage and it moves it to your local node and you usually get much better performance from TempDB. And so that's something you can do and you might want to do it, especially if you have an existing cluster that's seeing poor performance from your shared storage. Now, failover clustering gives you instance level high availability. So that means all of your databases, all of your logins, all of your linked servers, all of your agent jobs, everything is included. And as you add more databases and more things in the future, they're automatically included. So that's pretty cool. That makes it pretty easy to maintain. Now, Another weak point of failover clustering is the failover time. It's much longer than all these other technologies except for log shipping. And really what it depends on is how long crash recovery takes for each database. So you move the cluster resources over to the other node and then SQL Server starts and then every database on the instance goes through crash recovery. And how long that crash recovery takes depends on what your VLF counts are. So it's really important to keep your VLF counts under control for all of your databases. Now, always on availability groups. This was the new HADR feature that was introduced in SQL Server 2012, and most people are very excited about this and they want to use it, whether it makes sense or not. And this lets you have one or more user databases that fail over together, which is pretty nice, because that's pretty common to have several databases that are shared by an application, and they need to fail over together. And with database mirroring, you couldn't do that out of the box. Now, I've written code that lets you do that, but it's not included in SQL Server. So anyways, Availability groups requires a Windows failover cluster instance, but it doesn't require shared storage. And a lot of people don't understand that. So all of the nodes that are going to be part of your always-on availability group infrastructure have to be part of a Windows failover cluster. So you need to do that. And then once you've done that, you install SQL Server normally just as if it was a standalone instance rather than a cluster installation. That's the big difference here. And failover clusters you know, are used to control the failover and, and detect the quorum state, but they're not the same as with uh, traditional failover clusters because, again, there's no shared storage. Now, you can use shared storage if you want to, but personally, I don't like that. I would rather have each node have its own storage and you can have it be connected to a SAN if you want to, but personally, as a DBA, I would much rather use local storage of some type, of whether it's internal drives or PCIe uh, flash-based storage or even direct attached storage, for example. And always on availability groups were an enterprise edition only feature until 2016, where you've got a new feature called basic availability groups that I'll get into in a minute. And an availability database is just a database that's part of one of your availability groups. And you have one database that's the read-write copy. So all the writes are going to that. And then you have one or more secondary databases that can be either read-only or not readable. And in SQL Server 2012, you could have four of these, and they upped that to eight in SQL Server 2014. And all these databases have to be in full recovery model at all times, so that's an important restriction. And this gives you pretty fast automatic failover. And by pretty fast, we're talking usually 5, 10, 15 seconds in most cases. And it's also possible to offload read-only activity to your readable secondaries. But, and when I first heard about this feature in SQL Server 2012, I was pretty excited because, oh, that's, that's great because maybe I can stop having to use replication for reporting databases. And sometimes you can, but a lot of times you can't because a big uh, weakness of this is that you can't make any schema changes on your readable secondaries. So what's really common with replication is you have an OLTP database that you use transactional replication to to a subscriber, and then you throw a bunch of extra indexes on that subscriber and use it for reporting. Well, you can't do that with always on availability groups. Now, one thing that it does is that 
it creates temporary statistics in tempdb on the other node that help a little bit, but they're not the same as real indexes. So just make sure you're aware of that if you're thinking about going down that road. But it still can be useful for offloading read-only activities. So if you've got parts of your application that just do read, you might be able to point them at your secondary replicas. Now, basic availability groups, or BAG, is something they added in SQL Server 2016 Standard Edition. It only works in Standard Edition, by the way. And the reason they did this is that they deprecated database mirroring in SQL Server 2012, but they didn't give anybody a good replacement for it. And so finally, in SQL Server 2016, they allow you to have a primary database that has one replica. And the replica can either use synchronous or asynchronous commit mode, which is a big, big improvement. And because the problem is with database mirroring, and you can only have synchronous mirroring in standard edition and you needed to have enterprise edition for asynchronous mirroring. So now they've given you one of the former enterprise features in this feature. And so the limitations of basic availability groups, you can only have the primary and the secondary. And there's no read access on the secondary replica and you can't run backups on the secondary replica. And then only one database can be in a basic availability group. So it's very much like database mirroring. And once you've got a basic availability group, if you upgrade your instance to Enterprise Edition, you can't upgrade that basic availability group. You've got to tear it down and rebuild it as a regular availability group. And these are only supported if you're running SQL Server Standard Edition. If you have Enterprise Edition and you try to create a basic availability group, it won't let you do it. So if you are stuck on Standard Edition for budget reasons, this might be a good solution if you don't want to use database mirroring or you're worried about it going away in the future. Now, database mirroring, it's, again, database level high availability that was deprecated in SQL Server 2012. So when that happened, a lot of people got really panicky. Oh, no, what's going to happen? It's going to go away. Well, there's no kill switch for database mirroring. So if you're running SQL Server 2012 or 2014, and let's say it's 10 years from now, and you're still running SQL Server 2014, well, your mirroring is still going to work just like it does today, so don't worry about that. And it still works in SQL Server 2016. Supposedly, in the next version of SQL Server, let's call it SQL Server 2018, they're going to rip it out, but we don't know that for sure. So until that happens, database mirroring is still going to work just like it always has. And with database mirroring, you have a principal database and a mirror database that are on separate instances. And only user databases can be mirrored. You can't mirror your system databases. And all your databases have to be in full recovery model at all times. You can't switch to bulk logged occasionally, for example. And you have to pick. Do you want to do synchronous database mirroring or asynchronous database mirroring? And if you're on standard edition, you could have, only could pick synchronous. You couldn't use asynchronous mirroring. And if you want automatic failover with database mirroring, you have to use synchronous mirroring and you have to have a witness instance that's used to help decide whether or not you should fail over or not. It doesn't decide on its own. It just helps form a quorum to make sure whether you want to fail over or not automatically. And database mirroring gives you very fast automatic failover if it's set up for automatic failover. But again, only one database and only one mirror. Now, you could have 20 databases on an instance and each one of them is mirrored individually but they're completely independent from each other. They don't go fail over as a group. And database mirroring doesn't protect your logins or your agent jobs or your linked servers. So if you're going to use database mirroring or, or always on availability groups, you need to make sure that you script out all those things on your primary server and create them on your secondary server so that they're there if you need to use them after you fail over. Now, transactional replication. Not everybody thinks of transactional replication as an HADR technology, but it actually can be pretty useful for that. And it essentially lets you have a publisher database where all your rights are going to. And then you can have multiple subscribers in multiple locations. And you can decide to replicate the entire database or just parts of it, just certain tables or even portions of certain tables. And so as activity is happening on your publisher database, 
you have a log reader that picks that up and moves that over to a distribution database and then your subscribers can either pull from the distribution database or the distribution database can push it out to the subscribers. And doing this is going to add some read I.O. workload to the log file. And you have a similar thing for a different reason with database mirroring and always on availability groups. So you need to be aware of that if you're thinking about you know, how much I.O. capacity do I need. Uh, this technology and database mirroring and always on availability groups add a little bit of extra workload to support themselves. And all the changes that are happening to your publisher are temporarily stored in the distribution database. And sometimes the distribution database becomes a performance bottleneck if you're not careful. But the cool thing about this is, again, you can have multiple subscribers in multiple locations. And then one of the most useful things is that you can create new schemas and you can you can add new indexes and make schema changes of other types to your subscriber databases for whatever reason you want to. Now, peer-to-peer -peer replication is database level protection and it's enterprise edition only. And it's just a form of transactional replication that lets you have multiple writable copies of a database. So that's a fairly common requirement where some the business says, well, we want to have multiple writable copies in our two different offices and then have them somehow synchronize with each other. And so that's what you can use for this is peer-to-peer -peer replication. And you're making writes to each peer database and they eventually synchronize. And what eventually means depends on your infrastructure. But usually it's within a few seconds in most cases. And so quite often this is used for scalability purposes. You're trying to spread the load across multiple data centers and having some HA in place is just a secondary bonus. But you need to be aware that this is relatively hard to implement and maintain. And you may have to go in and make some changes to your application or your database. So for example, if you've got, if you're using identity columns in a table, well, you're going to have to either have different identity columns with different number ranges on these different copies of the database, or maybe you just have to not use identity columns and use something evil like GUIDs, which I really hate to use. And again, this is enterprise edition only. And personally, I haven't seen too many people using peer-to-peer -peer replication, but it can be useful in some scenarios. Now, the final one in this list is log shipping. And this gives you database level protection, and you can have multiple copies in multiple locations, and all your databases have to be in full recovery model. And if you need to fail over a log ship database, it's basically a manual process. But it's all, all it really is is just restore with recovery on the log shipped copy. So once you've made sure that you've got the last log back up and that it's been copied <clears throat> and restored, then you just recover it on the other side. And you can write scripts to do all that so it can go quite quickly. And log shipping, to be honest, is most commonly used for disaster recovery rather than HA. But depending on your situation, Log shipping is certainly better than nothing, and it can give you some limited HA. And it's also very handy to protect against user error, because you can have a log ship copy that has a delayed restore. So for example, you can have a delayed restore of four hours or eight hours on one of your log ship copies. So that way, if somebody deletes a bunch of data, as long as they tell you and you know about it before that window moves, you can go get the data from the log ship copy that hasn't had that delete happen to it yet. And you, another nice thing about log shipping is that you can combine it with most of these other HA technologies. So you could have failover clustering in your primary data center and then you could log ship to another data center. Or you could have always on availability groups inside of your main data center and then log ship somewhere else. And having log shipping in place doesn't add any extra performance overhead to the primary because you're taking log backups anyways. And all you're doing with log shipping is copying those log backups somewhere else and restoring them on each one of your copies. So it's a pretty cool, you know, kind of extra layer of protection on top of these other ones. So here's a little chart that just gives you some of the HA features by addition. So for Enterprise Edition on the left, you have all of these things available to you. And Standard Edition doesn't have a few of these nice features. And one of the big weaknesses of a Standard Edition was that database mirroring was only synchronous. And, 
and then always on availability groups wasn't available until SQL Server 2016, and you get that sort of cut down basic availability group. And then Express Edition really can't do much of this except be a subscriber or a witness for database mirroring, but all these other things are not available in Express Edition. So how do you go about planning a disaster recovery strategy? Well, you need to think about how you're going to do this and having a strategy for how you're going to go and recover from whatever happened. And no matter what else you're doing, as I said earlier, you need to make sure that you've got usable backups that actually work. And you need to understand and have a plan in place. Okay, if we lose this entire server and all the databases that are on it, you need to understand, and you shouldn't be thinking, you know, making this up on the fly in the midst of a crisis, which databases have to be brought online first? And what is your data loss SLA and what's your downtime SLA, your RPO and your RTO? And have a plan in place that hopefully you've practiced rather than just trying to figure it out in the midst of a crisis. And so a good disaster recovery plan should be written by the most senior people on your staff who've seen the most failures and have the most experience. And then you want to try to have the most junior people on your staff actually test it and see if they can do it and see if there's any holes in there because the senior people might just assume certain things that the junior people aren't aware of. And unfortunately, most of the time when many disasters happen is the junior people who are on duty, perhaps late at night or on a weekend or on a holiday. And so you want to try to write your disaster recovery plan so maybe there's no DBAs available and it's just your IT people who don't really know SQL Server at all. And if they can follow it and execute it, then it's a really good plan. And the plan needs to be as comprehensive and detailed as possible. You can't just say, restore database from backups. That's not good enough. You've got to tell them where the backups live and how to look at the file name to figure out what order to restore them and point them to where your scripts are that they can use to start doing the restores. All this stuff has to be available. And you should have some information in there. So what happens if you start running the restore and you get an error? What should you do? Well, call Glenn. Well, that's probably not the best thing to put in there, but there should be something in there in case everything doesn't go perfectly smoothly. You also need to think about the human factors. If you've got a widespread disaster, so for example, if you lost your entire, entire data center because your city got flooded, well, probably most of your employees are more worried about themselves and their family and their houses rather than coming into work to get your web application back online. So they may not be available in certain kinds of disasters. And it's really important that you actually try to test your disaster recovery plan. And each test, you're going to find holes in it. And so when you find these holes and problems, you need to update the plan so the next time you don't have that same issue. And that's another reason why I'm a big proponent of, and I have been for years, of keeping your SQL Server instances up to date with cumulative updates. Because when you do that, it, you're going to have to exercise your HA architecture. So let's say you've got database mirroring in place and you decide to do those rolling upgrades where you go and patch the secondary and then you patch the witness and then you patch the primary or the principal database server. And so by doing that every eight weeks when CUs come out after you've gone through your testing plan, pretty quickly you're going to not be afraid to fail over the database and you're going to be very confident that, oh yeah, when it fails over we're down for 10 to 15 seconds and then everything starts working again. This is how it works. So then by doing your maintenance, you're also practicing your HADR a little bit and getting confidence in it and understanding how it works so you're not missing any steps if you ever have to do it in a disaster situation. Now, more DR planning considerations you need to think about what would happen in a disaster if the servers were damaged. Let's say they were flooded. Maybe a sprinkler system went off in the data center and they're water damaged. What do you do? Do you have any extra servers? If not, how long is it going to take to get some? Can you call Dell? Is you going to wait for two weeks to get one or can they ship one to you in four hours? You know, can you go buy one on eBay? I mean, what would you do if the servers were physically damaged? Same way with the sand. What if happens if this magic sand that never can fail is somehow physically damaged? 
What if there's no power in the data center, even though they're supposed to have generators? What if that doesn't work or they run out of diesel fuel? What if the entire data center is gone? What would you do? Do you have another data center? Can you set up a bunch of servers in the closet of your office temporarily? Where are the off-site backups stored and how can you get to them? What if your backups are corrupt? Hopefully that never happens to you, but hopefully you've got more than one backup. So you've got your most recent backup and then you keep a number of other backups just in case the first one is not good. And then what if you're not available and you're the only one who knows SQL Server? Does anybody else know how to go and start working on this? People issues for DR planning. This is really important. If something happens, who gets notified first? And you know who do they notify? And then who's responsible as you're going through? So if you're replacing an entire data center, who decides, okay, we, we have five servers available, who gets them? And which ones do we build first? And who's kind of the sponsor that's driving this and who solves during the disaster, who resolves any disputes about, oh, well, we need our application more than you need your application. This should be thought about ahead of time. And then as you're going through this, your business is going to want to know, okay, how long do we get back up and what do we tell our customers? So who do you have to tell on the business side so they can do all the rest of the communication? And then a, a really important one is if you're down for a period of time, how long do you stay down while you're troubleshooting before you decide to fail over to your other side, whether it's another server in a database mirroring partnership or completely to another data center in another city? Because it depends on your business and you shouldn't be deciding because if you make the decision yourself, you're probably going to make it wrong from the business point of view. So for example, Maybe you're down and you and the other people who are working on it think, well, maybe we can figure this out in five or ten minutes. But the business might say, well, we don't want you to be down for five or ten minutes. If you're down for more than 90 seconds, fail over and then figure it out later. So this needs to be decided ahead of time and then somebody has to be the one who pulls the trigger to fail over. And then also, who's an overall command of the entire DR effort? and make sure that you've got contact information for everybody who has to be involved. And then you may need other teams, like maybe you need somebody from your QA department or you need some users to make sure that the application really works 100% after you fail over or after you've restored from all your backups. In some cases, it's pretty easy. If you've got a website, log into the website and do what you think needs to be done, that's good enough to start with, but it's probably not going to catch everything. That's why you're going to probably need subject matter experts that need to be involved towards the end of this process. Now, HADR testing, what you need to do is test your HADR solution before you go on production with various different kinds of failures. So what happens if you just walk up to the database server and pull out a drive or unplug the server entirely? Or what happens if you just drop a table or truncate the data in a table? or unplug a network cable. And this kind of testing is sometimes called chaos monkey testing. One thing I've done in previous companies is we would build up our solution and do all of our testing, and then we would go grab the receptionist from the corporate headquarters, for example, who may have never been in a data center ever, and tell this receptionist, okay, just go up to that server and unplug something or yank out a drive or do whatever you want and we're just going to see what happens. And that's better than having your network person do it because they're going to know, maybe just subconsciously, well, I shouldn't pull that cable because I know that's going to break everything. Or if you have a, a less technical person and let them do something, you'll probably find some holes in your testing. You know, another thing you want to try to do is how long does it take to install and patch Windows and install and patch SQL Server? And can I do that? Do I have everything I need to do that? Do I know where the OS ISO is and where SQL Server is? And do I have my license keys? And make sure that you can actually do that. Another thing that's really useful is how long does it take me to do a full restore from my backups? And does that going to meet my RTO goal, for example? And if you find out through all your testing that hey, we agreed with the business that we would have a four-hour RTO, but as we've done our testing, we, we just can't do it for this reason or that reason. Well, then you've got to 
talk to the business and say, well, look, we just can't meet this for our RTO, so we, you need to spend some money to get around this problem or else back off on the RTO, but make sure they know about it before you go into production. And then finally, you want you need to try to do some actual real life testing in production. And I know this is easier said than done, but if you don't ever do this, and then the first time you actually have to do it for real is in a real disaster, you're going to have a lot more problems. So a lot of companies who have really tight uh, SLAs for uptime do this on a regular basis, and it's a pain in the neck. You know, and so they'll just, they'll just come in and sit with no warning and say, okay, we just lost this data center. Deal with it. And they make and then they watch you to see if you can do it. And the first time it's going to be really stressful and a lot of things will probably go wrong. But then as you do it more often, it becomes just routine and it looks very smooth. All right, so I've got some resources here that are pretty useful, I think. A couple of old white papers that go through all the basics of all these technologies and explain their strengths and weaknesses. And I've got URLs for all of them. The one on the bottom is a newer white paper that covers always-on availability groups and how they work with other HADR technologies. So just to summarize, HADR is a lot more than just picking your favorite technology or feature. And the most important thing is that you understand your RPO and RTO SLA requirements and you've formally negotiated and agreed on these with the business. You need to make sure that you understand, you and the business, understand your budget and infrastructure limitations. So if you would like to have a secondary data center, but you've only got $10,000 to spend, that's just not realistic. Another thing is make sure, no matter what else, that you've got a good backup and restore strategy, regardless of what else you've got in place here. I can't tell you, again, how many times I've had managers and vendors tell me, well, you've got this whiz-bang thing we just sold you, so you don't need to do SQL Server backups anymore. And I will always, always push back against that because my backups are my final line, line of defense. And again, make sure you have good database backups. And the only way you know they're good is to restore them. I mean, sure, you can do uh, restore, verify, header only, and you can run their backups with checksums to give yourself a little bit more confidence that they're good, but you don't know they're really good until you restore them. So if you've got something automated in place to automatically restore them, then you know you've got good backups. And then finally, keep in mind that you can combine these eight different HADR features to have a more robust solution. So like I said, you could have failover clustering combined with database mirroring, or you could have failover clustering combined with uh, log shipping. So you can do different things to make your overall solution more robust. So that's it, and I've got some time for some questions if anybody has any. Yes, they've, they've got several questions. Um, the first one, you can maybe do an overall general one. Um, uh, one of the users was interested in the, the licensing input applications from Microsoft uh, for the different uh, types. They, they were asking about availability groups versus uh, Windows clustering. Uh, and I know it gets into a lot of stuff, but maybe just a general explanation might help. Well, Microsoft has sort of changed their policy on this with different versions of SQL Server. And it used to be on older versions of SQL Server that you only really had to license the active part of your solution. So if you're running database mirroring, for example, you'd have licenses for your principal server but not for your mirror server unless you were running snapshots on it and then using it for reporting and then you had to get a license for it. And that's generally speaking their policy. But with SQL Server 2014, they tighten it up a little bit and I am definitely not a licensing attorney from Microsoft, Who so is? <laughs> yeah, but you know the thing is, just generally speaking, if you're just using it for HADR purposes and not using it for any other reason, you don't usually have to get a license for it. But I, my guidance would be to check with your Microsoft uh, representative and get their okay on what you're planning on doing, so they don't come back to you later and make you have to get those licenses and true up. So. 
yeah, I'd get it in an email if I could. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Don't just get it verbally. Because you could have a different representative that's no longer there that said, yes, it's all okay. Okay, what's the difference between mirroring and basic availability groups? Um, I guess the advantages or disadvantages since you can still keep running mirroring even though it's been deprecated. Okay, well that's a good question. Well, database mirroring is reading the transactions as they come in and sending them over to the secondary, but it's not putting the same kind of load because when you use availability groups, it adds some extra information to your principal, and so there's a slight extra workload because of that. So that's one small disadvantage of a basic availability group, but a big advantage is the fact that you can use synchronous or asynchronous for your copy. And with standard edition of mirroring, you were stuck with synchronous. And the reason why this matters is synchronous database mirroring or a synchronous availability replica has some performance implications because you write a transaction to your principal or primary database and then it has to be sent over to the other side and hardened over there and then you get an acknowledgement back. It's called two-phase commit. And that adds some extra performance overhead and it's usually not a big deal if you're in the same data center, but if you're trying to do this with two, two separate data centers and you've got network latency involved or you have pretty poor storage performance on your secondary copy, that can be an issue. And so many people, even though they would like to do synchronous mirroring or synchronous availability groups, they just can't because of their infrastructure and they have to use asynchronous. And with database mirroring, with standard edition, you cannot use asynchronous, you have to use synchronous. So now you can go either way with a basic availability group. But beyond that, they're kind of by design very, very similar, a single database to a single copy, and the copy can't be read from. Now with database mirroring, you could take a snapshot of it, but that's an enterprise edition feature, a database snapshot, and then you could run reports against a snapshot. But not too many people did that in real life. So that's kind of the differences between the two. Okay. I know part of the answer to this. Uh, with transactional replication, can the publisher and subscriber be at different versions? I, I've not, I know that we can because I, we've got a 2012 publisher and a 2014 subscriber, but I know there's a limit. Do you know what the limit is, or do you just have to look it up for each different version? I don't know what the limit is. I mean, the subscriber has to be at least the same version or newer. It can't be an older version because you're restoring from you know, the publisher. But I don't know how many versions you can go back, to be honest. I don't either. That's why I was. we were only using it in one particular situation. Where, uh, but, okay. Does log shipping work between different versions of SQL Server on different versions, service packs installed? So between different versions and between the same version with different service packs? Well, it's kind of similar to the replication answer. You can be on a newer version on the log shipped copy, but you can't be on an older version. And as far as service packs go on the same version, I don't know. I, I think that would probably work in most cases, but again, as long as you're on a newer service pack rather than older service pack on the log ship copy, you should probably be okay. But ideally, everything's on the same version and service pack, but that's not always possible, obviously. Okay. What's the best practice for location of the SQL Server binaries on a VM? SQL data partitions in our environment are not backed up by our SAN administrators. SQL backups are performed. However, the VM partition is backed up. C partition is backed up. Does it make sense to set up the SQL binaries on the C partition? Hmm. Well, I mean, the most important thing is your data. As long as you're absolutely sure that it's okay, that's the first priority. And then the SQL binaries, I don't know. I mean, most people who are using VMs extensively are using things like Veeam to back up the entire VM image. But if they're not doing that, that's, that's definitely a weakness there. But, of course, at a standalone instance, you're not typically backing up the SQL binaries very often either. And most people are more worried about being able to restore their data rather than restoring SQL Server or having to reinstall it, for example. 
So I'm not sure I have the best answer for that, but yeah, and I was I was kind of waiting for the first virtualization question. They always come up. <laughs> okay. This user said, I have yet to see a DR plan that includes a process for failing back to the primary site after the disaster is passed. If valid production data has been written to the recovery site, it needs to be preserved going forward. Can you speak to that? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that's that can be very painful because with most of these things, well, it depends on which technology you're using. So, for example, if you're using database mirroring and you fail over to the secondary server, well, and, and the, the original server is not available, it depends on how long it's not available because as long as the mirror partnership is in place, all your transactions are going to be building up on the server that you're running on. Your transaction log is going to fill and grow. So you need to decide <clears throat> how long do we think this other server is going to be unavailable? Is it coming back in an hour or two or is it just gone forever? Because if it's gone forever then you're going to want to break the mirroring partnership and then all the data is on the other server and when the, the original server comes back up at some point in the future you're going to have to reestablish your mirroring partnership. That's one way you handle it, but if it's only going to be down for, say, an hour, well, then you can just let the transactions build up in your transaction log, and then when this comes back up, mirroring will automatically get them synchronized. It may take some time, depending on your infrastructure. So it comes down to whether or not your original server is coming back soon or never, what you're going to do. And then there's other things that make this more complicated, because maybe you had mirroring on your main server and you had replication going and when you failed over to the other server that messed up your replication you may or may not be able to fix that so you might have to reinitialize all your replication for example so it's a, it's a pretty complicated subject but as long as you didn't do what's called a forced failover where you had stuff that hadn't been applied on the secondary before you failed over to it you typically aren't going to lose any data and then once you decide to go back as long as you've been able to get the data synchronized again, then you're not going to lose any data. And so the main question that the questioner had is not going to be a problem. But if that wasn't the case, then you're going to have to figure out, okay, we're going to keep this one on the secondary server available so then we can compare the data and then try to manually get it synchronized after the fact. Okay. Um, and this would probably be the last question. Um, do you have a general template DR plan for SQL Server? I think the last thing that you were talking about uh, is a, a guide, but I guess they're wanting a template to kind of walk through. I don't really have a general template like that, I, but I am working on this document for one of my customers and I'm probably going to eventually blog about that just sort of a list of SQL Server reliability best practices the whole list of steps and links. It's a big Word document. So I think eventually I'm probably going to blog it and make, make it available that might be useful for that. It just goes through everything that I can think of that you should do to try to make you know, your backups more reliable and your instance more reliable. And you know, So I think that might be a useful document. But it's not ready for public release yet. OK, now there's some other questions I just roll the screen up and found some more. If I send these questions to you, can you just blog about them? Yeah, I can either blog, yeah. And and also, if people have questions that they just didn't think of now or they just or didn't want to ask, send me an email, glenn at sqlskills.com, and I will, you know, try to get you an answer. Good deal. I'll send you these questions. Um, we uh, just want to remind everybody about uh, next week's uh, Down Under session, Securing SQL Server Recommended Pass Practices uh, on August the 9th. And uh, we've got a session coming up that I didn't have listed with Pinal DeVay, uh, Performance Tuning Methodology as Pinal sees it on September the 20th. And thanks for everybody showing up. Um, I appreciate it. Thank you, Glenn. That was great. Thanks to our uh, sponsor, Kevin, uh, with SQL Sentry. And we'll see you next month and next week uh, if you go to the Down Unders presentation. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Glenn. I'll send this stuff to you. To you. Okay. Thanks, Kevin.